Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I am so blessed. Hashtag blessed. So are you. If you don't believe me, maybe you're having a rough day or a rough week and you're thinking that you're not blessed. Let's just go through a list of basics. Did you have clothing to wear today? I'm going to assume yes, otherwise there probably would have been some shocking sounds when you walked in this morning. (laughs) Did you have food to eat today and yesterday? Did you have a place to sleep that protected you from the rain last night? Do you have a job that you go to, or are you benefiting from a job you've worked in the past that is taking care of you now that you've retired? Did you know that in most of human history, none of those things could be assumed None of them could be taken for granted. They were not given to a large number of people. So you and I are blessed. So blessed, in fact, that we often don't notice these things. They just have become a part of our everyday life, so much so that we just look past them. That's why when I when I was looking for something to use the chil- for the children's message, this, the keys were a great example. I carry my keys with me everywhere, yet I hardly ever think about what they're for. Right? The key denotes ownership of something, and if I were to tally up the monetary value of everything on my keychain, it's pretty significant. Yet, it isn't the number of things that we have that count us among the blessed, although... We are thankful that God has given us those things. And during a sermon series on stewardship, we're certainly going to be talking about them because our Lord Jesus talks about them. No, the main reason that you are blessed is because of who you are, or rather, who God has made you to be. So you might have guessed it by now, but we're talking about stewardship. Stewardship is a fancy church word, which I'm, all, I'm sure you're all super excited to hear about. And I can tell you I'm super excited to preach about it. This is one of those sermons when you're at the seminary that you really would rather wish you didn't have to preach. But as I've spent time in the ministry, it's actually something that is a blessing to talk about. Because stewardship gets a bit of a bad reputation because most people think it's just about money. And it's about the church saying, give us your money or something to that effect. And in some cases, unfortunately, there may be some truth to that. But that's really not what stewardship is about. It's related to that, but it's much larger than that. So today is the first of a four-part sermon series on the concept and teaching of stewardship from the scriptures. So what is stewardship? Stewardship. Well, in order to understand what stewardship is, we might first want to know what a steward is. Because you would imagine that stewardship is the state or act of being a steward. Well, steward is somebody who has been appointed to take care of someone else's property. Or a manager might be a similar type of term. And there are numerous parables that Jesus teaches us about this very thing, that the master of the house has left a steward or a manager in charge of his property. So that's what it's really about. It's our relationship to the things that we quote-unquote own. And what we find out when we look in the scriptures is that even though the world tells us that this belongs to us, that we own it, according to the scriptures, we do not. It belongs to someone else. And not just the stuff that we have, but our gifts and talents, our time, and yes, the scriptures even say our bodies are no longer our own possession. So you see, stewardship really isn't about possessions. That's not the heart of what stewardship teaches. Stewardship is really this. It's really about understanding the real state of things. It's really about understanding the real situation that we are in when it comes to our relationship with God and the things that he has blessed us with. 
So in order for us to understand this real state of things, we should probably start by looking around and taking stock of our current situation. Are we rich stewards or are we poor stewards? Are we good stewards or are we bad stewards? And what exactly does it mean to be a good steward? So in order to answer these questions, we're going to dig into the long gospel reading we had today. It's one of my favorites in all the scriptures, the parable of the prodigal son. And the theme for us is going to be recognizing what blessings we already have. So just to kind of go back and give a quick summary of the parable, there is a man, the father of the household, he has two sons, and his youngest son comes to him and demands his inheritance, the money that he is owed when his father dies, and then he, it's passed along to him. Well, he doesn't want to wait that long because he's got some plans for the stuff that he thinks is rightfully his, and so he demands it. And then you know the rest of the story, right? He goes and he squanders it on reckless living to the point where he ends up hitting, quote-unquote, rock bottom. He's feeding pigs for some random person in the country he now finds himself in, and he's so hungry that he would be happy to eat the slop that the pigs are eating. And I don't know if you've ever seen pig slop, but it's not very appetizing. So he's very hungry, he's down and out, And we're going to learn a little bit about what this teaches us regarding stewardship. So this text teaches us primarily three lessons. The first lesson is that we do not often recognize our blessings or where they come from. The second is that we think that they belong to us, and so we squander them. And third, that even then we don't often recognize the true blessing that has been given to us until we have nothing left to stand on. So the first lesson, recognition. Does the prodigal son recognize his blessings? No, he doesn't. He wants what the father, what he believes the father owes him. Now, if you know anything about inheritances, they're sort of, in this culture, expected. But the father doesn't have to give his sons any money. He could decide to give it to a random person when he dies, right? So the father doesn't actually owe the son anything, but he's choosing to give him something because he wishes for that blessing to be a benefit to him. But the son is demanding his inheritance because he doesn't recognize this fact, and his father, because his father is loving and gracious, gives it to him. And the son wants this because he believes he can use it however he wishes, that it's in service to his needs and wants. So what blessings does the son fail to recognize? Well, just to name a few, he fails to recognize the blessing of a secure home. He fails to recognize the blessing of being a loving member of a family in good standing. It was quite a place to be the son of a wealthy, secure household. And most of all, he probably failed to recognize his father's love. So what blessings, I ask, do you fail to recognize? Things that you take for granted that are with you right now, just like the son. He had all of these things already in his possession at the beginning of the story. Loving parents, a good job, a secure and stable home, a good church home, a solid group of support among family and friends and just generally daily means to provide for what you need and those that are under your care. We in our country have become so used to having those things that we now believe them, some of them, to be rights that if we can't provide them for ourselves, they should be given us by other people. Now, in the spirit of Christian charity, some of that is true from the giver's standpoint, But really, our world, our sinful and fallen world, does not guarantee that anybody's going to give us any of that stuff. But we, as Christians, recognize now that those come from God. But often, if we're being honest, we're like the prodigal son. We think the world owes us things. We think God owes us things. We think they belong to us, and we fail to recognize them for what they are. Whenever I was preparing this sermon, I'm somewhat of a nerd, 
which may be news to none of you. Um, and one of my favorite stories growing up as a kid was the story of Lord of the Rings. I read The Hobbit. My dad gave it to me when I was in like fifth grade. And one of the most iconic characters from that series is Gollum. Now, if you're not familiar with Gollum, Gollum is a twisted and pitiable creature whose entire life is obsessed with owning a ring. And he does, he kills his best friend over it. He forsakes all ties with anybody else just so that he can have it and he can keep it for himself. And so he's famous for this line, it is mine, my own, my precious. That's the only thing that he deems precious. And see, God does not want us to have that sort of relationship with the blessing he intends to give us, to become so obsessed with those things, to think that they belong to us so securely that they twist us up into ways that he does not wish to see. The father in the story of the prodigal son by no means wants his son to go out and squander the things he intended to bless him with, with reckless living. He certainly didn't want him to be feeding pigs and starving to death. So this is the second lesson. The danger of thinking these things belonging, they belong to us. And because they belong to us, we can use them however we wish. So the son spends his inheritance not as the father hoped he would, not as the father intended for those blessings to be used, but as he himself saw fit because he believed they were his. This is not what a steward does. Because a steward recognizes that they don't actually own any of the things that have been entrusted to their care. And because of this reckless living and this thought that all of this belongs to him to serve however ne- what his needs are, he hits rock bottom. He squanders it, and he finds himself in a desperate situation. And this is where the fa- my favorite part of the whole story comes in. Because we can really relate to the plan that the prodigal son comes up with, right? The scripture, the the text says, when he came to himself, right, he has this sort of aha moment because he's sitting here starving, wishing to eat this gross pig slop. And then he realizes that even the servants in his father's house have plenty to eat and are cared for. But the reason that I like this part of the story so much is the way that he explains what he's going to do is it makes perfect sense from a human standpoint. Is this guy worthy to be the son of such a loving father after what he did? By our standards, most certainly not. By his own standards, he doesn't believe he is. And so he comes up with this plan to go back to his father and appeal, not on his mercy to remain a son, but to confess and say, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But let me work as a hired servant in your house because at least then I know I'll be taken care of. Not worthy of sonship anymore. He's going to appeal to be a servant. Well, if we're being honest, we also live our lives believing that we own the things that God has given us. Own them in such a way that we think we are supposed to be able to use them however we wish. It's ours, it's mine, it's my precious. It's my body, it's my time, it's my money, it's my, 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 my. And it is given to you, yes. Just like the father gave the inheritance to the son. But the question is, for what purpose? So now we're at the turning point in the story. The prodigal son has come up with this plan and he's heading back to his father But this is where it still is very interesting to me that the prodigal son still doesn't understand the true nature of the blessing that he took for granted from the very beginning. Because if he did, this plan would make no sense. So he still doesn't understand the heart of the matter when it comes to stewardship. You see, the father's love, as we come to find out, isn't based on performance. It isn't based on the way the son used the gifts. So, are you a bad steward? 
like the prodigal son, maybe. Or maybe you're a bad steward like the elder son, who you work diligently and you do all the right things, but then still think that you're owed things because you're doing what you're supposed to do. Maybe you've squandered your time. Maybe you've squandered your children's time. Maybe your money has become an obsession for you, the sole place you find your security. Maybe you haven't let your gifts be used for everything but to glorify God and his church. Or rather, maybe you have let them be used for everything else, but rather not to glorify God and his church. Or maybe you just have trouble being consistent on the priority you place on God's blessings in your life. The truth is, we can all answer that question to one degree or another with the answer, yeah, I'm a bad steward. That's the situation, right? So the goal of the sermon today is to figure out what our current situation is. The current situation seems to be we don't recognize our blessings for what they are. We think we own them and therefore we live in such a way that squanders those things that not only harms others but harms primarily ourselves. And third, that we don't really grasp the true nature of the blessings of being God's steward until we have nothing else to turn to. But don't let the story stop there. So the prodigal son has come up with this plan. He's on his way back. I can almost imagine him rehearsing his lines so he can get the wording right so that he can guarantee that he'll have something to eat And what does the text tell us? It doesn't tell us that the father stands there with his arms crossed, tapping his foot, saying, I told you so. Or, I'm glad you're back, but you're going to have to earn your way back into my good graces. Instead, it says the father sees him from a long way off and has compassion and runs out to him and gives him a hug. And he gets one line of his grand plan out before the father, totally ignoring him, starts ordering his servants about to give him a ring and a cloak and to kill the fattened calf and throw a celebratory feast because his son has returned alive. His son who was lost is now found. So I think it's really important to highlight all aspects of the situation as we delve into the topic of stewardship because I don't want you to hear the commands of God to use his things to glorify him, to bless others, and to bless yourself in a law-oriented way. Yes, God does have expectations with the things that he's given you, and those expectations are for your own well-being so that you don't end up starving in a foreign country, desiring to eat the slops fed to pigs. But it's also true that in the midst of that, the crushing reality we receive from the law is that, yeah, we, despite our best efforts, still fall into the category of bad steward. God knows this. And so it's important to finish the story. It's important to remember that even though the son was a bad steward, about as worse a steward as you could be of the gifts that God had given him, when he returns and confesses and appeals to the mercy of his father, it's even greater than he imagines. So he was content to come back a servant. And at times, we make those kind of deals with God too. We feel like we have to earn our way back in when, in fact, your heavenly Father sees you from a long way off. And he has compassion on you. And he runs out to you and celebrates the return of his child. So as we delve into the topic of stewardship and we learn what the Bible has to say about it, don't lose sight of that situation both The reality that we don't live the way we ought to when it comes to the blessings that God has given us. But also the reality that swallows that up in the grace and love of God through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. That even when you're a poor steward, never once does the Father consider you anything but his child. And when you return, rejoices and has a celebratory feast in your honor. So dear friends in Christ, 
Stewardship can be a tough topic because maybe we haven't spent our money the way we should. Maybe we haven't spent our time the way we should. Maybe we haven't spent our talents and gifts in service to God as he intended. And we do need to confess that and by the grace of the Holy Spirit desire to do better. But don't let that draw you away from and don't let Satan try to get in there and convince you that because of that, like the prodigal son, you're no longer worthy because you are worthy, not by your deeds, not by your good or bad stewardship, but by the Son of God's perfect stewardship. He took your bad stewardship on himself and gave you his perfection when he went to the cross. And so you return as his child. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until he comes again to make all things new. Amen.